Hi, and welcome to Rhonda London Live. On the show today, voter apathy. Despite Canada's growing population and increases in the number of eligible voters, fewer people voted in last November's federal election than since 1984. In the last election, voter turnout was 61.2 percent. Back in 1988, it was 75.3 percent. Some contend the reason for the decline is Canada's first-past-the-post electoral system, which turns off many voters. It's the system that gave the Liberals 57% of the seats in Parliament, even though they only won 41% of the popular vote. Some Liberal spin doctors, however, say the low voter turnout is a sign of contentment. Canadians are happy with the status quo, and that makes us apathetic about casting ballots. What do you think about all of this? We are required by law to respond to the census. Should we also be required by law to vote? As always, the phones will be open to take your calls to hear your thoughts. Don't go away. Rondo London Live will continue right after this. Canadians are casting ballots in federal elections. Consider this, in 1988, voter turnout was 75.3 percent. In last November's election, it was only 61.2 percent. Some contend the reason for voter apathy is our conventional first-past-the-post electoral system, which allowed the Liberals to gain 57 percent of the seats in Parliament with only 41 percent of the popular vote. With his thoughts on all of this, we're joined by Paul McKeever. He's a lawyer, and he's the chair of the Freedom Party of Canada. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Rhonda. What are your thoughts? Why are Canadians seemingly so apathetic about voting? Our forefathers fought and died for the right uh, to experience democracy, for the right to cast that ballot. Why have we become so lazy and apathetic about actually exercising that right? I don't know if it's a question of laziness. I mean, a party can do two things. A party can either follow the will of the majority of, of people mm -hmm. or it can lead. And when it leads, it sometimes makes choices that are the right choice for Canada, but that aren't necessarily popular. If you're a voter and you're happy with things the way they are, then you're basically given three, three main parties right now to choose from, the Liberals, the Canadian Alliance, the PCs, and they're all follower parties. They all read the polls, find out what people want, and then that's all they'll ever give them. Only the safe stuff, the stuff that will keep them in power. When you are a person who's not content with the status quo, you're looking for someone who will take the tough stand. And that is a party that you will not find currently uh, in, in the House of Commons. So when, you, when it comes voting time, those who are content with the way, things the way they are basically say, oh, who cares, whatever party, I'll get what I want. And the other people are saying, who cares what party, I won't get what I want. Do Why you think, vote? Do you think Canadians are content? I don't think they're content at all. Uh, and, and I think the percentage of people Were they content who, last November? Well, you know, uh, that's a good question. I think what happened there, again, was that you had a lot of people who said, Look, we got three parties who'll just follow the mass and they're too afraid to do anything that really matters. I want some real change. None of those parties are offering it. I'm not going to vote. And then, as I say, there were some who were content, particularly those who get the $800 million free uh, uh, interest free loans and that kind of thing. They, you know, a few uh, friends. Well, Bombardier yeah. and et cetera. <laughs> yeah. uh, but apart from those uh, big companies, there are some people who are relatively apolitical and who are just trying to get on with life and maybe they're in the upper income bracket and they're not too affected by politics but I think by and large most people are looking at the parties and saying mm -hmm. they're dishonest, they're not principled, they're only doing what they need to do to keep their seats and that will never mean the thing I want them to do. I need a principled party that will lead and they're just not seeing it there as an option so why go and vote? It's pretty shocking though because of our electoral system it's pretty shocking that you can have 60 percent of the country voting against the Prime Minister and yet you know Jean Chrétien uh, wins 57 percent of the seats in Parliament. I guess he's the, the least hated of the people who aren't liked. Um, that's but certainly... 60 percent of the country voted against him. <laughs> that's right I mean I, the phenomenal uh, news yesterday was uh, that Albertans are actually considering turning their votes to the Liberals. Well, you have to know that it's not that Jean Chrétien is popular in Alberta. It's rather that the other two parties are so unpopular 
that even this unpopular party would end up with the majority because not because they're popular, but because the other two parties are so unpopular. So really there is a vacuum right now in Canada. People are looking for a principled alternative, parties who are willing to lead and take the tough stands on the things that really matter to them. And we're not seeing that with the three parties that are currently sitting in the Commons. Should we be concerned, though, about the declining voter turnout? I think it's a pretty, my personal opinion, Paul, is it's a very, very sad commentary that only 61%, 61.2% of Canadians voted in the last federal election. I think we should be concerned, but I, at the same time, you have to remember, freedom doesn't come free. If you want to be free of the system that you're in right now, you have to think about the fact that, for example, uh, you don't have all the time in the day to read all of the reports on immigration, monetary policy, etc. You need to be able to delegate your responsibilities in that regard to a representative. And, and so, in short, you, we have political parties that are there to represent the, uh, the people for that reason. Those parties don't exist. Uh, without uh, money, for example, or people on the ground supporting. And so if you really want freedom nowadays, just as in the past, it's your responsibility to say, okay, here's 50 cents. Am I going to buy a coffee or am I, am I going to put that in a jar and give it to the party of my choice? It's a Saturday. Am I going to sit and watch reruns of the Brady Bunch or am I going to get up and maybe spend half an hour doing a little door-to-door, -door doing uh, dropping, dropping leaflets so that I'm making an investment now, come next election, my option will be there, my choice will be there, and my party will have an option or the possibility of winning. Well, the question that we're asking today, should should you be required by law to vote? Uh, collectively, we all agree as a society, some things are of such paramount importance uh, that legislation is need to govern it. For instance, and I know how you feel about filling out the census. You're not a big fan. Not at all. No, not at all. But even filling out census information is required by law, and there are pretty stiff penalties if you refuse to, to fill out your census form. You're required to fill out a, an income tax uh, form every year, even if you don't owe anything. Right. So collectively, as a society, we all agree that these are such important things. Perhaps we should make voting ha you know, carry the same weight. Well, I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want to give up the possibility of people uh, saying, you know, none of these parties... I mean, right now we're, t we're having a discussion about voter apathy. And the only reason we know that there is voter apathy is because people have the option of not voting. Mm -hmm. We know that we have a pathetic situation right now where most people don't want the party in power and they want even less the other two parties. It's, Canadians are crying out for an option. The only way we know that is because a lot of them didn't show up at the voter booth. So but if you we, can still register your protest. You can purposely spoil your ballot or you can decline your ballot, which sends a pretty strong statement. Certainly that's not A lot stronger than just, you know, staying at home watching the Brady Bunch and not bothering to go out to the polling station. Yeah. Certainly. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really in favor of any government intervention that requires right. you to do something um, when, what we, when what you are doing is perfectly peaceful mm -hmm. to begin with. I mean, if you want to sit at home and not become politically active, fine. Although you should remember that you're responsible for your own fate. Uh, I don't think it's the government's role to make sure that you take on a responsibility that... Uh, you have the choice of accepting or, or rejecting. Okay, our phones are ringing. A lot of people feel strongly on this issue. Let's go to Celine on line one. Go ahead, Celine. You're on the air. Who? Hi, was go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You're on the Neville? air. Yes, go ahead. No. Should voting be mandatory? Yes. Now, who enforces it, and does this become law? Well, that's the question. Nobody is proposing that, except we were throwing that out there as a question today, Celine. This is not a, a formal proposal by any major political party. It's just a question that we're asking today. So it would be enforced the way your census information it would be enforced or the way your income tax is enforced. All right, then I'll say this much. The, the less we have in law, mm -hmm. I think the better the society is and the, and the individual has to be responsible for themselves. So, Celine, you know, you're calling in anonymously. We only have your first name. It might not even be your real first name. Can I ask you, did you vote in the last federal election? Yeah, I always have. Okay. And, and I agree with you. Like, you know, if you lodge uh, your complaint that you don't want to vote for somebody is one thing. Right. But if you spoil your, your ballot, it amounts to a row of beans. It just goes in the garbage. You're not protesting anything. Because at one time I voted and I put Jesus Christ across my my ballot because I was just incensed. Right. Now I'm saying that I have found out since, do not ever do that. Go and register mm -hmm. uh, that you are not satisfied with any of those running for politics or for running your government. Register that. Don't ruin your ballot. It's a waste of time. 
Celine, thank you so much for your phone call. Your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm 100% behind Celine. Uh, I agree. Uh, we have to be able to tell the people and tell the government that none of you guys are offering what we want. And that also tells the people on the ground that, okay, it's time to organize and provide a group that will represent the needs of the people who aren't being represented. See, and I think declining your ballot or deliberately spoiling your ballot, I think that speaks volumes. Well, I, I mean, I guess it's a, a question of style. I, mm -hmm. I just wouldn't I want to be throwing... I think it's a stronger, stronger message than sitting at home watching the Brady Bunch. Sure, I mean, uh, I just wouldn't want to be throwing people in jail because they didn't vote. I, mm -hmm. To my mind, okay, that's a valid way of objecting as well. And to push people into, mm -hmm. a, into a cell because they didn't vote, I think, is uh, particularly when, you know, they're going to feel obliged to pick one of those three uh, undesirable parties or follower parties or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's I think we have to leave the option open. Okay, we have to take a commercial break, but don't go away. Phone's very, very busy. We'll get to more of your calls when we come back. The numbers to call 905 332 Welcome back to Rhonda London Live. Today we're talking about voter apathy and the question we're asking today, should voting, should casting your democratic ballot, should that be required or mandated by law? We're joined in studio by lawyer Paul McKeever, who's also the chair of the Freedom Party of Canada. And you are very much against any kind of government intervention, although you have to be concerned about how apathetic Canadian voters have become. Uh, I think 61% voting in the last federal election. Right. I think that the real approach here is, is twofold. One, obviously Obviously, there's a need for electoral reform. Um, that is very difficult without first becoming the party in power because the, the mm -hmm. current party in power, the Liberals, will never allow something like a single transferable vote, which would allow uh, a person's wishes mm -hmm. concerning party to be represented in the House in terms of members. That won't happen as long as the Liberals are in power, or, or for that matter, the Progressive Conservatives or the CA. They, they are all parties that were, are seeking power and seeking to keep power. Um, that's one thing, electoral reform, but that's not the that's not the problem. That's not why people are upset. People are upset about, or people want electoral reform because it's the only way they can seem to get their party to make a breakthrough. And the parties they're trying to get a breakthrough for are those parties that are trying to stand for something other than just reflecting whatever the polls say from day to day. Uh, really, what needs to happen is a change in the Canadian attitude, and I, I don't think this is a big change at all. But when I go, when I wake up in the morning, I have my breakfast. I go down to the coffee store and I buy myself a coffee. Right. And it costs me, you know, anywhere from a dollar or fifty cents for a, for a lesser expensive coffee to if you go to a, uh, one of the big brands, the Starbucks right. or what have you, maybe maybe you're paying as much as four dollars a day. Now, no one should be having to pay four dollars a day, but think about it. If you just put a dollar a day or fifty cents a day toward, uh, or or just put a little bit of your time toward supporting the party of your choice, you are buying. You're making an investment in change in your life. It's your life that you're taking responsibility for. I think, if anything's unforgivable, it's that people aren't more involved at the party level because it's only the parties that can essentially form a government. And right now, the Liberals, the PC, the Alliance are getting the most, most of their funds, not from, from uh, individual members, but from big corporations who are really setting the agenda. I mean, we are given little gifts every once in a while. Come election time, the Liberals gave us a tax break because they knew it would keep them in, in our good books and maybe we'd vote for them again. And right after that, we have them giving $800 million for the second time, $800 million interest-free to Bombardier. Uh, let's not fool ourselves. These parties want power. They please us to keep it. They serve people who we don't even know. Um, large corporations who use government as a tool to increase profits. That's what we're really talking about. And if you want to change that system, you've really got start to start investing yourself in a party of principle that listens to what you have to say and that does what you need it to do. And that is to act on principle even if it's not necessarily popular. Okay, our phone's so, so busy today. Let's go to, is it Ritu on line five? Hi. Hi, go ahead, you're on the air. Um, my comment towards this uh, question here is I don't think it should be mandatory because a lot of people just don't follow politics these days and they don't have enough knowledge about what party is running against what and if we've got people voting um, as a mandatory factor then that would just make um, our results biased. 
Yeah, you know, you bring up an excellent point. And, you know, I've heard this argument before, the fact that um, the Canadian public is not very savvy when it comes to political issues. A lot of Canadians don't cover politics. And perhaps it's a good thing that they're not voting. Well, there's certainly that argument. I, I wouldn't want to deny anybody the vote. Certainly, who am I to judge what a person knows or what a person feels about the issues? Um, and I think ultimately the message has to be that people have to remember they are a part of the system and that if they aren't part of it, if they don't make themselves part of it, if they don't fund it, if they don't get on their feet and walk on, the, on that Saturday afternoon, someone else will. They will lose. The ones out there walking and paying will win every single time. Well, this is a quote from a liberal pollster, and he says, uh, should we care about the current low turnout? Well, a higher turnout is a democratic ideal, but consider, though, that one in 20 voters does not know the name of the Prime Minister of Canada. One in every 18 do not know who their Premier is. Some 15% of Canadians can never aim an issue they believe to be important. 15%, Paul. And then more than half, this is astounding to me, do not know the difference between a deficit and a debt. So maybe, you know, that's a pretty compelling point. Maybe these are people who should not be mandated to vote. Well, and, and I don't expect everybody to have knowledge of highly technical matters either. We, we assign lawyers to do our legal work, dentists to fix our teeth. But knowing the name of the, the Prime Minister of Canada, Certainly that's, that's not highly technical. No, that, you're right. That, that would be nice. And, and we have to fault people's apathy, I think. And when you feel like the system is one that won't, won't serve you well, when you feel that the people involved in the system are simply out to serve a few corporate interests and to, and to pander to us to make sure they get our votes, you really don't take an interest in politics or the players in it. Um, but, you know, again, it's a question of, of, of giving people hope, giving them a choice that can really offer change, and making sure they understand that nothing will change unless they put that money aside or they get on their feet and knock on doors and work for their own freedom, their own choice and their own success at election time. Okay, let's go to Mara on line six. Go ahead, Mara. You're on the air. Hi. Hello. Um, my comment was that if voting is mandatory, I think that there should also be a mandatory educational system mm -hmm. where people learn about um, what goes on in the Canadian political system right. from like public school days. Mm -hmm. We were just having this conversation in my political science class at York University. And there's so much voter apathy because, like, um, the first call, what the caller just before me was saying mm -hmm. is that, you know, people don't know what's going on. Right. So, excuse me for the phone ringing in the background. Okay, um, that's okay. I think that if there's a mandatory educational system, you may not even need mandatory voting because people would be more interested in going out and representing what they want to be in government. Mara, thank you for your phone call. Your mm -hmm. response to that? Well, I think that's, that's fair. I mean, the education system certainly has been letting us down in many ways. People don't understand the basics about money. They don't understand, as you say, the uh, difference between a debt and a deficit, which is a very basic, yeah. ba basic thing. So we are being let down there. And as I say, though, uh, in an age when you're so busy trying to make ends meet, you really need agents. You need people to, to take care of your teeth, to do your medical work, to do your legal work, and to represent you mm -hmm. effectively in government someone who will take the time, all of their time, who spends their day learn, reading those reports, getting the right experts on the right problems, and making sure that for your money, you got what you wanted. Okay, let's go to Ashley on line seven. Go ahead, Ashley, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Ashley, go ahead. Um, I'm actually underage, and I can't vote yet, right. but I think that's going to be a good thing that you guys see perspective of a younger kid, kind of seeing how the people that are actually, like, choosing who's going to get our education and everything. It's sort of weird because here's everybody, you know, they're complaining about how there's a lack of things being done and there's all these things, you know, oh, we don't like the education system. But really that's just a reflection on how involved we are and not us, just like the older people and how involved they are in actually trying to find out things about people and trying to find out the things about the different, like, systems. And I think that we really have no reason to complain about it because that's, that's all our doing. If we're not going to understand anything or not going to try to understand a little more, that's our problem. I mean, we have no reason to complain. I totally agree with having to put money into it and trying to go around and tell other people about it. I think that, that that's really that's going to be the outcome of our future. That's how, that's how things are going to happen if we actually take time 
Yeah, thank you so much for your phone call, Ashley. And that's what you've been advocating yeah. this afternoon, Paul. And, and certainly, and we see that. But we like to sit back and complain. That's a lot easier than actually doing Isn't something. It? Oh, Isn't yeah. It? It's, it's, it's the much, Canadian way. That's right. And you know that's got to change. And we see, actually, it's not the Canadian way. When you see people on the streets in Quebec City, now I may or may not agree with everything that everybody there had to say. There were numerous issues being raised. But what we saw there was a lot of hope in the sense that we saw young people taking an interest in their future and realizing that parties who simply reflect whatever you know will get them into power are not going to reflect your interests. You've got to get out there, get your point made, not with violence, but by getting politically active. It's just a part of your day. You might have a religion, you might have a philosophy, but you certainly should also make sure that you have a political perspective or at least a, a party that's going to help you understand what the world is around you and how, make it a better place for you to live. And you're going to have to take a small responsibility. It doesn't have to be a daily chore because, I mean, we don't do our own legal work, we don't do our own medical work. But we do need to appoint the right people and we need to give those people our support. They are a service. Parties are a service. And they're an essential service if we're going to change things. Okay, Paul McKeever, our time is gone, but thanks so much for joining us. It's always so nice to have you on the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Don't go away, phone line's very busy, but we do have just a couple lines open right now. I want to hear your thoughts on this issue today. The number to call is 416-203-0302. We're back with more right after these messages. Welcome back to Rhonda London Live. Today we're talking about voter apathy in Canada, declining numbers at the ballot box. Joining our conversation, Liberal MPP Dr. Marie Buntriani from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. How do you feel about voter apathy? Do you think, you know, there are some who would suggest that really it's nothing to be concerned about. A lot of people don't even know the name, you know, one in 20 voters don't even know the name of the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. um, Voter apathy just simply means that people are happy with the status quo and content with the way things are. I disagree with that. I don't think voter apathy means people are, are happy with the status quo at any level of government. I think when you don't vote and when, when governments of any political stripe see voter apathy, it gives them license to do what they want. And that's not a democracy as far as I'm concerned. I am a liberal. I'm happy the liberals are in Ottawa, but I don't like the fact that there isn't a viable opposition. I think any government of any political stripe needs a viable opposition. And I think, again, if, if few people go out to vote, if few people know what's going on, that gives any government permission to then you know, storm ahead with its agenda without consulting. And I think that's dangerous. And I, I, the young people are getting more and more interested, but it is difficult even to get the young people out to vote. I've had numerous experiences mm -hmm. with that. Um, and the senior citizens are, are sort of easy to get out to vote. I think they see it as a duty. Right. They've been through a lot. They know the importance of their, their vote. Perhaps they have fought in the war or know someone that has. Or, and and they, they believe that they need to, to do this as their duty to democracy. As well, um, I was born in this country, but my parents were, were born in Europe, have gone through a war. My grandparents gone through a number of civil wars and the First World War. Those stories have been seeped into my consciousness ever since I was two years old. I can't imagine not voting. I can't imagine giving any government the satisfaction of not voting. And so I vote, and I think there are a lot of people that have that, that background that vote because of their background. Part of the problem, though, a lot of people feel, wh why even bother? Because with our first-past-the-post electoral system, you know, you have a situation, and I know you're happy about this, the fact that the Liberals have a majority government, but, you know, the Liberals garnered 57% of the seats in Parliament, but yet only garnered 41% of the popular vote. In other words, 60% of the country voted against them. Mm -hmm. Well, we have the same situation at Queen's Park. The Liberals at Queen's Park received 40% of mm -hmm. the vote, and the, uh, the Tories 45%, and yet right. they had the vast majority of seats. So, And there will be a parliamentary reform committee at the provincial mm -hmm. level looking at that. And I, and I do hope that that changes. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of the expert reports before I, I sort of garner my mm -hmm. own opinion on how it should change. But yes, it is frustrating. And as I said, yes, I'm a liberal, but I think there should be a viable opposition to us, whether it's in Ottawa, whether wherever we are in, in government. It, there should be an opposition, absolutely. Okay, our phone's very busy today. Let's go to Peter on line two. Go ahead, Peter, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Peter, go ahead. Yes, about this voting. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we get rid of voting completely? 
-hmm. It hasn't worked for the last hundred years. Still not working. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all kinds of things wrong with it. What we should do is advertise for each department in our in our system mm -hmm. to handle our money, hire the best qualified people in that area who have experience with a few assistants. Mm -hmm. People don't know how to vote. Look what they did in this last provincial voting. With all those blunders, they voted the government in with a majority. Look at the blunders they're making now. Okay. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much for your phone call. The only problem with Peter's suggestion that I could see just on the surface of it, just giving it a cursory observance, is the fact that if you've ever tried to accomplish anything important, you cannot do it by committee. Mm -hmm, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, you try to get anything done. You try to, like, even pull out of your driveway by committee and you'll be there for three weeks. And the, the positive aspect of democracy is if the person you have hired through your votes doesn't right. work out, you can vote them out the next time. And so uh, I understand Peter's frustration. I, I, I share it, in fact, in this particular case, but I disagree with his solution. I think voting is very, very important. Again, if you've come from a background where you weren't allowed to vote, and certainly uh, where I come from in Greece between 1967 and 1974, there was an American-backed dictatorship in that country. People weren't allowed to vote. They weren't even allowed to speak against the government. Mm -hmm. I think you, and I, and I visited my relatives during that time, I think you begin to appreciate the value of voting and the value of democracy. It, it's not perfect, but it's still the best system we have. We just have to improve it so that people are better represented. All right, let's go to Holly on line eight. Go ahead, Holly, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Holly, go ahead. Um, I was just thinking, you know, like, of course, voting should be mandatory. Like, I do believe in vote. Like, everyone should vote. It should be something like you do your taxes, you should vote. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe who there should be a space for, you know, none of the above, you know. Right. If you don't want to vote for anyone because you think the government is corrupt and mm -hmm. whether it's the Tories or whoever, you know, liberal, there should be, <laughs> I'm sorry, just like a lot of people just vote for mm -hmm. <laughs> the uh, sake of voting, you know, who, who should they pick, you know, like, a lot of people don't even know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah th thanks for your phone call, Holly. You're right. A lot of people is sort of, you know, you don't really want to vote in anybody, and you just sort of pick the lesser of two or three evils. Well, part of it is our education system, and there's very little on Canadian and provincial politics and municipal politics next to nothing in our curriculum. There's a little bit now in grade five, and I know that because I get invited and our, you know, my colleagues get invited to speak for about 20 minutes to a grade five class. Uh, that's not enough. I think there has to be more education. So, again, if you don't have the knowledge, why would you have the interest? So. Uh, get, get the kids educated so they know who the Prime Minister is, they know who the leaders of the opposition parties are in Canada, they, they know the issues. Um, we used to have current events, you know, mm -hmm. decades ago with the dinosaurs when I was going to school, but that was a good, that was good that many schools don't have that now because the curriculum is so packed with requirements that they can't have that. And I, I think that's, that, that was a loss. Uh, to counter that loss, they do have the grade five part of the curriculum that has a little bit of uh, politics. That's not enough. Uh, my kids, of course, obviously are political. They have no choice. And they know the names of all these people and all over the world, not just Canadian and provincial. Uh, however, the majority of their friends don't. And, and, and I think that's a shame. Uh, there are very few issues, for example, that my kids, and only because of the fact that their mother's doing this work, no other reason. Right. They didn't before I was elected two years ago. Uh, they know the issues. And so I, I would predict that they will be pretty good voters later on, and they will vote for the party that they think will solve the problems. Whether the party solves the problems or not, well, that's, that's the test, and that's why we have a democracy and a, and a vote every four years. Well, Marie, to Canadian ears, it's a pretty provocative question or a pre pretty provocative issue to say, should voting be mandatory? It almost, uh, you know... It, stands in the, you know, flies in the face of, of our democratic ideals, you know, well, we shouldn't be forced to do anything. But we're forced to do a lot of things in this country. We're even forced to fill out a census form. Mm -hmm. We deem that to be important enough to legislate it and to mandate it. Mm -hmm. Why not something as important as voting? Well, I think before we, we go there, before we uh, uh, think about making it mandatory, we have to make it easier for people to vote. Uh, the advanced polls just don't do it for certain shift workers, for certain people in the rural areas. Uh, in some countries in Europe, uh, vote, elections only take place on a Sunday, which increases the probability that people mm -hmm. 
can vote. Uh, again, there are people, of course, that work on Sundays, and, and that wouldn't work for them. So we have to make it easier and more accessible. There are a lot of people that had difficulty in the last couple of elections. They didn't know where to vote. It was, it was, it was, it was a mess, actually. And um, some people just gave up. They went to one poll, sorry, you're not registered here, and then they left. It's too bad that they, that they had that kind of apathy and they didn't pursue it, but that, that is what happened. And I think we have to do that. I think we have to educate the public starting from elementary school so that there's a natural interest in voting. Once that is done, if voter turnout is still low, then I think we have to entertain more in sort of uh, intrusive measures. Until that point, though, I think we have to look at why it's not working rather than impose something which in the end may cause more voter apathy or protest. So yeah, there, there, ha there have to be a few intermediary steps, I think, before we entertain the, that sort of measure. That's a good point, because in the last provincial election, I was fairly new to the Burlington area, and it took a lot of phone calls and standing in line for an hour, and I had to drive across town, and I had to, you know, you know pick up some forms, and then, I, you know, on the day I actually had to vote, and it was problematic, but I was determined. Yeah. I was determined that I was going to cast my ballot, but... You know, everyone's leading very busy lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And not everyone is going to be that determined to. No, and there are certainly certain situations where you can't expect certain people to vote. It's very difficult for them. If, if they're in the middle of uh, mourning someone that they've just lost, you're, you're, you, know, you have to be sensitive to all those issues. So again, I agree with Paul on that one. I wouldn't throw anyone in jail for not voting. That does fly in the face of democracy. However, I think if you want to complain, if you want to have a voice, you need to vote. Uh, there's nothing worse than hearing a complaint from someone right. that doesn't even know really what you represent, that thinks you're a municipal politician when you're a provincial, thinks you're federal when you're a provincial, and you have to just tell them where to call. Right. Uh, and so, so they aren't even informed enough to know who they should call. That, that's sad, and I think that's a little bit of apathy as well. And I think we should take some responsibility as politicians, a lack of education to the public of what we do. Uh, certainly, before I was elected, I was not political at all, and I didn't know what an MPP did. All I knew is what they did in the legislature. I didn't do any. I didn't know any of the other duties when the legislature was closed. Maybe so you again, wouldn't have run for office if you had have known what you were in for. <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> it's not an easy. It was job. a moment of madness, that's for sure. <laughs> Dr. Marie Buntriani, I want to thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's always a pleasure coming and speaking to you, Ron. Don't go away. We're going to continue this conversation. A few phone lines open right now. Want to hear your thoughts? The number to call is 905-332-3131. Back with more right after these messages. Welcome back to Rhonda London Live. Today we're talking about voter apathy in Canada. And with her thoughts, we're joined in studio by Adrienne Snow. She's a managing director of the Centre for the Study of Civic Renewal. Adrienne, you say that one of the problems with this voter apathy, this declining turnout at the, you know, at the ballot box, is the fact that we're raising our kids without teaching them very much about the Canadian political system. Whereas, you know, our American friends south of the border, um, kids learn a lot about the political system. Absolutely. Um, a recent study published by the Institute for Research in Public Policy looked at this question of civic engagement and civic literacy, and it identified a few culprits or a few problem areas that are contributing in the Institute's view and in mine, I think, to the decline in voter turnout over the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, the way the media covers politics is one, and also the fact that not very many Canadians read a daily newspaper is part of the problem. Um, I think a second problem is the federal system where people feel disconnected from the level of government uh, to which they send most of their taxes and the press spends most of its time covering. But a really huge issue is indeed the question of civic education and general education. There's a fascinating correlation between general literacy levels and general numeracy levels in a society and civic knowledge and awareness. And so I think we've got two problems in the Canadian school system. One is that Canadian history and civics are not mandatory in most provinces and where they are the exposure the kids get tends to be very limited and very short as your 
guest Marie was saying earlier. The other is that um, general literacy and numeracy, numeracy skills, which are, are essential for understanding what's happening in the world around you, are not being taught to kids sort of at the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder. And they're unable to participate in society in a host of ways, including turning out to vote and taking an interest in what's happening in government. Okay, our phones are so busy today. A lot of people feel strongly about this. These must be the people who actually voted in the last federal election. I hope so. <laughs> let's, let's hear. Yeah, let's go to Isabel on line five. Go ahead, Isabel. You're on the air. Hi, how are Hi, you? Hi, Isabel. Yes, um, answering your question about if uh, should be voting mandatory, I believe not because, like they said, we need a lot of education because you cannot send somebody to vote when they don't have a clue what they're doing. Uh, but we have to understand that the, that's the purpose of the government here. They don't want to educate the people. They don't want people to know a lot, you know. And it's a lot of fault of the people, too, that they don't want to do something that they should do, you know. But in my case, I have been here in 28 years in this country. I'm a Canadian citizen, and the past four years I have been no voting because I don't see, I don't trust in anybody now. You know, I have to admit, you know, for many, many, many years I was liberal. I never was a conservative, oh no, my God, but a uh, liberal, but I'm even trusting liberals anymore. I Isabel, I'm going to stop you there because we're going a little bit short on time and I want to give Adrian a chance to respond to that. Will you say that that, you know, that is a common feeling, you know, that people, Canadians feel it doesn't matter what party we vote for, it's going to be just the same old, same old, same old, because the problem isn't necessarily the, the individuals, it's the system itself. That's right. I mean, I think there are a few reasons people feel detached from the political process. For one thing, the media, with its emphasis on catching politicians out every time they do something wrong mm -hmm. and standing on guard against corruption, on the one hand, they play a very valuable watchdog function. On the other hand, they do feed into this overwhelming cynicism about the political process that a lot of people, I think, are suffering from. I think there are some reasons for that. I think people who go into journalism and into the media, by and large, tend to have sort of a left of center worldview. Uh, they tend to think that the world should be utopian and perfect mm -hmm. and they're always looking for problems with big government big business uh, while promoting more government programs at the same time the average citizen doesn't care about a lot of the politically correct causes that the press is always holding up as the most important things for politicians mm -hmm. to be addressing they want to know are our hospitals working are our schools working am I getting good value for my taxes and is there any way I can pay less tax to the press they're intellectuals they're people who have ideological access to grind they're not covering that stuff and it makes the average voter feel that whatever is happening up there on Parliament Hill or in Queen's Park or in their local legislature has very little to do with their lives and I think that a lot of people do feel the way your caller did. Plus it's it's difficult too. like I see the same thing happening with governments uh, in their second term it's almost as if in their first term they are something new a breath of fresh air and then by their second term I don't know whether they've been corrupted well, I, that's a strong word. I don't mean corrupted by the system, but it's so influenced by the system, uh, dragged into sort of like the malaise of the Canadian political system, that they end up being, you know, very much of the same you know, the same old, the same old, the same old. I think complacency does set in. I think Paul was saying earlier in this show that there is a tendency for politicians to be far too poll driven mm -hmm. and afraid of standing up strongly for principle and demonstrating genuine leadership. And that also feeds into the problem. I think one thing we might want to look at is the idea of term limits. I think if voters knew that everyone they elect is going to be in office for no more than eight to ten years, two mm -hmm. terms in office, at which point we're going to throw the bums out and bring right. someone new in, there would be an incentive for people to engage in the process. They they would feel my vote matters, I have an opportunity to make a genuine difference every eight to ten years at least. Under the current system, we have some liberals sitting in Ottawa who have been sitting in the House for over 30 years. Who knows what they're doing? Who knows what they've ever done? I think they certainly are suffering from extreme complacency and that makes it hard for people to care. Well, we know that they voted themselves in a double-digit pay increase. Absolutely. But Adrian, I'm not bitter about that. Not bitter at all. <laughs> Let's go to our phones. Let's go to Miriam on line five. Go ahead, Miriam. You're on the Hi. Um, I was actually Canadian-born, and my parents became citizens about 20 years ago, and they were coming in from the Middle East where voting wasn't really an option there. Mm -hmm. And my comment is actually that so many people come here um, for that choice of religion and, you know, such, and voting. But the thing is, my parents haven't voted in the longest time, mm -hmm. and the reason for this is they don't really understand what's going on. And I think that it really should be um, focused towards the children and the schools because for those that have parents that aren't really um, understanding of what's going on, we need the kids to understand more so that when they're older, they'll be able to understand the political system 
and everything that's going on there because we're really what the future is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's really key to finding an effective reason. And that's why a lot of people I don't think are really voting because mm -hmm. they don't understand. Okay, Miriam, I want to thank you so much for your phone call. And you agree with Miriam. I couldn't ask for a more relevant mm -hmm. call. I'm so glad mm -hmm. she phoned in. The director of, effective, of our Effective Schools program at my center uh, happens to teach grade five in the Peel Board of Education. And we were talking about this issue just the other day. And she said, you know, I was doing the short unit on civics and government that is required for all grade five students in the province of Ontario last year before the federal election. She said, I think three of my 29 students were Canadian born. The rest mm -hmm. were born in other countries. And she said, what I discovered through them about their parents is that their parents are simply so busy trying to get ahead and make a living and doing all the things that attracted them to Canada that first of all, they don't have time to participate in the political process as much as they would like. But second, um, either because of language barrier issues, which are particularly in areas like Toronto are huge, or because they lack understanding of our political system, which is exactly what Miriam just said, they feel unable to participate. And I think one question, if Canada is going to continue to be a heavily multicultural and immigrant-influenced society, as I think it should be, I think it's wonderful, we need to talk about civic responsibility and knowledge, not only for children, but for people who are becoming new Canadian citizens. I know that there is a test you have to pass, but I'm not sure that we're impressing upon people who choose to come to this wonderful country that they have responsibilities as well as privileges as citizens, and then providing them with the tools they need to carry out those responsibilities effectively. Okay, let's go to Mary on line one. Go ahead, Mary, you're on the air. I'd like to make a comment on, on your show here. Yes. Uh, I'd like to know more. If I vote, I vote, we vote all the time, but we don't know enough about what we're voting. Mm -hmm. We don't know enough about the people we're voting for, and we like to know the background of them. If they run a good family, then they're good, good to vote for. You know, people who stand up for their uh, mm -hmm. promises, what is they promise us, and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah, promises, promises. Thanks so much for your phone call, Mary. I, want to pre I appreciate your thoughts. Um, and, you know, another part of the, of the problem, too, you know, Mary saying that we don't know enough about the people that we're supposed to be voting for, is the fact that because of our, you know, and I've been harping on this a lot today, but because of our electoral system, you know, first past the post, uh, you might have a wonderful candidate uh, that you would like to vote for, but what is, what is the point? That is a problem. I also think media bias factors into it. I talked earlier about how the media tends to take the most cynical view of politics possible because that's of sort course. of the ideological disposition. That's what of the sells the newspapers it's and that's what makes newspapers. for good talk shows. And as Paul was yeah. saying earlier, to engage in the political process properly and get past the spin and past the cynicism of the press, people do have to be prepared to do some hard work. And he's right. Participating in a political party, doing a bit of campaigning, making a donation, or even getting involved in grassroots civic voluntary organizations tends to give you some exposure to your community leaders. Beyond uh, telling people to do that, that they've got to go out and seek the information themselves, I'm not sure there's a lot we can do to correct that problem. Adrian Snow, our time has gone, but thank you so much for joining us. It's always so nice to talk to you. You're very welcome. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more Rhonda London Live after these messages. Stay tuned. <laughs>